We're going to move on to the next set of elements in our uh, structural palette. Uh, we've spent a long time now on beams and beam design, talking about the complexity of bending in spanning elements. And we're going to switch now and we're going to talk about the pieces that usually support those beams. Uh, column design, we're back to axially loaded members. So members that uh, only have loading along their longitudinal axis, only in compression or tension, uh, which sounds simple. And we've looked at axially loaded members before and when we were first introducing statics. We're going to dive in and examine uh, some of the finer points. And in particular, we will deal with uh, one very complex issue when it comes to compressive uh, axially loaded numbers, uh, and that is buckling. And we'll talk about how we design uh, columns moving away from, uh, from beams. So in our um, uh, schedule for 347, uh, we've done equilibrium, we've done beam design, we're now on column design. After column design, we'll look at the kind of two end conditions, floor slabs that gather loads, foundations that spread them out, and then we'll very briefly look at uh, framing and connections, how all of these get kind of welded uh, together. So to get through column design, we're going to talk in this video about uh, tributary areas uh, and how we uh, assume that floor loads are getting taken up and, put, and basically put into columns. They do this usually through beams, uh, but when we're sizing columns, we're looking for the, the entire load that a column is going to carry so we can figure out what the compressive load will be uh, in it. And then we'll go on and we'll talk about how columns fail, uh, obviously what, how we uh, prevent that, and a few little uh, math pieces to get at the behavior of columns under buckling instead of just crushing, which we've looked at before. So for uh, this video, we'll talk about load paths and we'll talk about tributary areas. And as we're designing a structure, we'll usually look at the horizontal loads first. We'll figure out the size of the slab. We will design the beams, which we've done for a, a, a few videos now. And then once we have all of those horizontal loads, we will look at uh, maybe the architecturally desirable layout of columns and walls. And we'll think about how each one of those columns or walls are picking up the loads from the floors above. We'll assume in all of these uh, for the moment that we have pinned connections so that we can easily solve for the, uh, for the uh, uh, beam using shear moment diagrams and uh, sum of moments around the supports equals zero. As we'll see when we get into um, end conditions of columns, we uh, may go back and rethink some of those connections based on what the column design tells us. How the columns are attached to the beams and how they're attached to foundations turns out to have a very important impact on how well columns perform. So even though in calculating the loads in the tributary areas, we'll assume pinned connections. In a couple of videos, we'll talk about why those assumptions uh, might be improved in terms of how the, the structure behaves by thinking about other ways to connect uh, beams and columns. Once we've uh, sized the horizontal members, we need to step back and we need to look at how those floor loads are going to flow into the, the columns uh, in, the, in the spacing that, that we've given them. Usually as architects, we're going to be trying to find regular spacings for columns. In commercial construction, we're usually looking at uh, base sizes of between 25 and 40 feet. That may be impacted if we have underground parking, it may be determined by both the size of the building footprint and also the programmatic layout that, that our client wants. However that works, we'll look at the column grid, we'll look at the floor plan, and we'll think about uh, the, the easiest, most effective way that loads will flow into columns. So as you can see here, this is a, a building structure with a slightly irregular column layout. And the diagram is basically taking each one of the column bays and dividing them in half to, uh, to, in both directions to come up with a, a basic area that we can assume is gonna flow into each column. For a square column grid, this is relatively easy. We'll go through an example of this in a minute. But essentially, we're basically dividing up the floor plate into what we call tributary areas. 
areas that uh, we assume are going to be gathered up by the column uh, and supported by it. It's not a precise science, depending on how the floor joists and girders are laid out. Uh, things may be more or less uh, accurate when we're figuring tributary areas, but it's a basic uh, idea of how much load is going to flow into each column. Once we've done that, we have to treat columns basically uh, as giant rivers where the loads from each floor are flowing into the column. And as we go down the building, the columns are taking up more and more load, right? They're picking up not only the load of the floor immediately above them, but they're picking up the load of the column above them, which is carrying the floor above them uh, and so on and so forth. So you can see here in this diagram, we'll do a, a section drawing like this where we look at each column and then we try to think about uh, what not only the load of the structural uh, element right above it might be, in this case a roof load, but also what the loads are for all of the floors that the column picks up as it, as it comes down. As you can see from the arrows, this column is picking up the load only from the top story. The column down here picking up not only the load from its floor, but the load from all of the columns above it. And just like a river, right, the, the amount of load in a column that is downstream is always going to be more than a column that is upstream. Do we size them differently? We can. Sometimes we do. Uh, but as we'll discuss, we are not only worried about the loading itself on columns. We're also worried about uh, the proportions of the columns. And so very often it makes sense, at least over the space of a few floors, uh, to make columns that are the same size, easier to construct. And even if the columns on the upper floors are a little underloaded, uh, sometimes there are constructional reasons uh, to oversize columns to match the, the columns below. Now, the other thing that you'll notice from this diagram is that the columns are actually stacked on top of one another. And this is key for structural efficiency. We can move loads around by transferring them, but when we do that, we put a very, very large shear load onto whatever the structural element is that's bridging between one column uh, and the next. So when we do what are called transfer structures, if we're, for instance, bringing the loads from, uh, say, an office slab down over maybe a very large lobby or an auditorium, we'll have a, a girder here that has to pick up in this case, four floors of loading and actually move it over right to a, a pair of columns on either side. That's absolutely possible. But think about what the shear diagram there looks like. We're putting a huge point load onto this girder and therefore we're going to have a, a massive uh, big arrow P here that's going to be reflected by a very, very high shear condition. Uh, at the um, uh, between that load and its support. Sometimes these uh, transfer girders can get to be a whole story or two. Sometimes we will sacrifice a story and actually have a transfer truss. Uh, we'll actually use diagonal members to bridge that load uh, more efficiently to other uh, structural elements, to columns below them. The worst case is a condition like this, where we're literally trying to bring several floors down onto a single girder. And you can imagine here that the shear problem gets to be really, really big. We end up, uh, if it's concrete, with an awful lot of rebar. If it's steel, we end up with a very, very deep, sometimes also a very, very thick built up steel beam. These are expensive solutions, they're possible, but we're putting money into a piece of hidden structure that we would probably want to use elsewhere. So the most effective way to design a transfer structure is to simply design the structural system the bays so that we're not having to move loads around uh, in section. What does the transfer girder look like? Here is maybe the most uh, famous one I can think of. This is the uh, Brunswick building in Chicago, one of Fosler Kahn's earliest tube structures. And you can see that uh, Kahn on the upper floors, floors three through 39, uh, is trying to get a density of structural elements so that the building basically works like a, a giant punctured set of shear walls, right? The principle of a tube structure, we'll talk about this later, but uh, it's that you put all of the structure on the outside. Um, what Khan is faced with though, is the architects want giant, big, open glass lobbies down at the base. And so Khan has to take all of the loads from all of these columns 
and he basically has to move them over uh, about a 60 foot span to get the, the large open lobby that the architect and clients want. And as a result, there's a solid concrete girder here that is 24 feet deep. And it's that deep to take both the bending loads, but also the shear loads from all of these columns, 39 floors of load that are basically sitting on top of air. Now, they were able to use this space. There's a giant mechanical room behind that transfer girder. Um, but you can imagine that in other situations, we may not have room or we may not have the ability to get such a giant piece of, of carrying structure uh, in place. So again, we want to find solutions for a column design where we can take those loads all the way down uh, to foundations. We want to try to avoid things like transfer structures uh, where we can. So let's look at how we calculate tributary areas. Uh, we'll use as an example, a uh, very simple floor plan, six bays of 30 foot by 30 foot uh, span. And as architects, we'll look at this and we'll see the column bay uh, as each one of those 30 foot squares. 30 feet, by the way, very common because you can easily uh, accommodate uh, an underground parking garage in a 30 by 30 bay. The tributary area for each of those columns is going to depend on what's around it. So in the middle columns, uh, we will be taking one quarter of each of the four surrounding bays. So that column is picking up one quarter of this bay. It's picking up one quarter of this bay, one quarter of this bay, and one quarter of this bay. Now, this is almost kind of trivial, right? One column picks up one whole structural bay. That, that doesn't seem uh, terribly complicated. Um, the issue is that when we get to the outside, uh, this column here is picking up a very different load. Because there's nothing on the outside, that column is picking up one quarter of this bay, one quarter of this bay, and it doesn't have anything to pick up out here. So the exterior column is actually picking up half of the load that the interior column is. And when we get around to a corner column where uh, this is outside here, that column can only, only has to pick up one quarter uh, of a single bay. So if you think about this, in this one bay, uh, the corner bay, we have a column that's picking up only 25% of the load that its neighbor, its diagonal neighbor, is picking up. So when we're designing these, we want to be careful to think about um, what the column is sort of responsible for. And the way we'll do this is we'll basically divide all of the bays in half in both directions and then assign a column to the kind of territory uh, that's contained within that, within that square. So our worst case, obviously, are going to be these two center columns. Each of those are picking up a full 30 foot by 30 foot uh, bay's worth of floor load, 900 square feet. So again, we may have a structural drawing or an architectural drawing that shows a 30 by 30 bay. And for the purposes of column design, we'll think about that almost kind of uh, uh, thinking about going on the, on the, going from uh, mid-span to mid-span. So how much is each column picking up? Each column in the middle is picking up 30 by 30. Uh, but we'll draw it like this. And that square, that one quarter of each of the four surrounding bays, that is that column's tributary area. Now, if we're designing a multi-story building, we have additional steps that we want to take because if we have, say, a one, two, three, four, uh, one, <laughs> one, two, three, four story building, we have four structural slabs and we have one, two, three, four floors of columns that are carrying those. Each floor of those columns, each column on, on those floors is carrying a slightly different load. We can calculate the load for each uh, level. So we'll usually be given uh, a, a loading criterion. For floor loads in this case, we're gonna have 150 pounds per square foot, fairly heavy uh, load, conservative one. For roof loads, half of that. So this is in a place that gets uh, a lot of snow, like maybe Iowa, Minnesota. So for the roof, we have 30 feet by 30 feet, 900 square feet, and we're given a load of 75 pounds per square foot. And the area that one column will pick up 
will be equal to that column base size, 900 square feet, times the load per square foot, or in this case, 67,500 pounds. The floor loads uh, being twice as much, uh, each one of those floors will have a, 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 a load that's twice as much as well. The area will be the same. We're just going right down through the building. So that square applies to the roof and then every floor below it. And in this case, that 900 square feet, we're multiplying it by the figure we've been given for floor loads, 150 pounds per square foot. So that is 135,000 pounds. And that'll be the same for the two floors uh, below it. So we have one floor where a structural bay uh, weighs 67,500 pounds. We have one, two, three floors where a structural bay weighs 135,000 pounds. Now look what happens to each column. If we start at the top, the load on this top column is just the load of the roof bay. So this column is carrying 67,500 pounds. It's only responsible for that roof. The column right below it is carrying the floor above it, that 135,000 pounds, but it is also carrying the column right above it. And it's taking that column's load and adding it to the load of the floor that's right above it. So this column, even though the floor above only weighs 135,000 pounds, this column is picking up that 135,000 plus the 67,500 here, or a total, if we add those up, of just over 202,000 pounds. We do the same thing for each column. And you can see that as we come down to the base, these floor loads add up, right? Again, just like a river that's taking not only the uh, water from its uh, origins, but all of the water from all the creeks and streams and things that, that flow into it until by the time we get down here, we have a load that is almost half a million pounds. So this column is carrying a much greater load than the column up on the top. And particularly in a very tall building, as we look at it, we might expect to see uh, a change in the size or sometimes in the, the, um, the, the density of the columns. We might, for instance, have a, a, a W36 down here and something more like a W12 or W16 uh, up here. So the columns themselves might get smaller. If we're concerned about uh, construction and how we attach columns to one another as we go up, we might make all of them say a W24, but down here we might have a W24 that weighs maybe 150, 200 pounds per linear foot. Up here, we might have a W24 that weighs more like 30 or 40 pounds per linear foot, uh, reducing the cross-sectional area of the column while keeping some of the construction dimensions. Okay, that is a primer on tributary area and load continuity. In the next video, we'll get into the column itself and we'll look at how columns want to fail. Um, we've done a little bit of this when we talked about crushing and we use some very simple uh, area and allowable stress calculations. Nothing is ever that simple. And we have this other mode of failure buckling uh, that particularly as we get down through the building into lower level floors that may have higher ceilings like lobby floors, we'll see where buckling becomes often the governing issue uh, in column design.